notifications from where? Oh. I guess if that makes sense mm -hmm. like you have been right in so many respects in so many <laughs> regards it's just insane and like the more that I experience as an adult now I'm just like yo he was right when I was a kid you were always so calm so collected this dude don't worry about nothing go ahead and introduce yourself people know you as my dad pops and everything but who are you what is your name <laughs> This is so weird. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever had like an interview like this before? Um, no. I'm your dad. Uh huh. I'm Wayne. I'm a junior. What else do you want me to say? You were uh, born in Buffalo, New York, October sixteenth, nineteen sixty-four. That was like during um. Jim Crow, ending of Jim Crow. Well, not really the ending of Jim Crow, but it was it was definitely there. That was the same year Dr. King was uh, assassinated or a couple years after. Yeah. I think it was 68, I think he may have been assassinated. So with, with Grandmommy, it was five of us. Auntie Trina, me, Auntie Benita, uh -huh. Uncle Carl, and Auntie Nina. And in the mix of that, Granddad had Uncle Sean, I mean, Uncle Terry, Uncle Sean, Auntie Caress, Auntie Cahilla. I remember you told me once Granddad was kind of a rolling stone. Yeah. A little bit. What were your parents like, from my understanding? Like, super strict or? No, Granddad was not. Mm. Grandmommy was. He was super, super strict. We didn't have the greatest relationship, and I just remember all the time feeling like, it, she had a different relationship with me than she did with my brothers and sisters. I used to get beat and punished for everything, any little thing, even things that I didn't do. You weren't the oldest, right? No, Auntie Trina was the oldest. But um, I didn't know because they split early. Because I remember her always moving us. We moved so much. The funniest thing was I remember one time we moved and we moved two doors away from Granddad because yeah. <laughs> she didn't know that she moved two doors away. But she was trying to keep us from him. Mm -hmm. So there was many years she was trying to keep us from him. but. He would always find us. She would move and then we'd be in the window waiting. But because we didn't know, he didn't know where we were, we sitting there waiting and she would tell us things like, see, I told you he didn't love you. No matter what, we still, we still love daddy. I tell people all the time, I think I had whooped Jamal. And so I sat on the floor and I cried because I was inflicting pain on my kids and, mm -hmm. and I, all the, all the beatings that I got from my mom, I never wanted to have to do that to my kids. And I yeah. said, I know I gotta be smarter than these kids. I have to come up with another way. And, and I, I came up with my system of always being proud. Yeah, I'm always so proud of you and just all the accolades and always trying to make you guys feel like you were doing great, great, great. You guys didn't grow up too far from one another. No. Well, um, so here was the thing about Buffalo. Buffalo was very segregated, mm -hmm. extremely segregated. So when we brought on Guilf, not on Guilf, when we moved on Northampton, that's where Grandmommy bought her first house. What year was this? Oh, wow. This, I was still in elementary school. I had not even, I was still in elementary school at this point. I don't remember how long we stayed there. It wasn't, it wasn't maybe a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And then Auntie Trina and I were at summer camp one year. Mm -hmm. And while we were at summer camp, Grandmommy bought a new house. And mm -hmm. that's the house she bought on St. Louis. So when we moved into that house on St. Louis, I think there were five other black families on the whole block. Yeah. And we're talking about a block of maybe with 65, 70 houses on it back then. There were no, there was one vacant lot yeah. on the whole block. But it was like five black, we were, or we were the fifth black family to live over there. Fifth black family on the block. The fifth black family on the block. What was that like? As long as we stayed on our block, because yeah. we were so small, mm -hmm. we were still little, everything was good. Yeah. I mean, we played with the white kids, but I, I remember we weren't allowed to go into their homes. Mm -hmm. 
I remember the white guy lived right next door to us. He was Polish and he was super prejudiced. Really? But he allowed his little girl to play with us. Yeah. But he, he was prejudiced. So one side of the street was Genesee. Mm -hmm. If you go up to Genesee, that's where all the black folks was at. I remember my mom bought her first house on this street called Northampton and it was all blacks on this street in Northampton. Growing up for, for us in our household was really different because my mom's grandfather was the first black licensed plumber in the city of Buffalo. Really? Yeah. A little bit more history. I don't know if you want to keep this in there or not, but my mom and her brother, uh, her mother was a prostitute. Really? Yeah. Then and you said that uh, we had pimp in the family or something? My grandfather. Grandfather. Okay, my mom's mother name was Nina. She married Roy. Mm -hmm. Roy was her pimp. Her pimp. She married her pimp. And so she had two kids, mm -hmm. two kids by one of her Johns, mm -hmm. who was named Milton Miniweather III. Okay. Incidentally, whose, whose father was the first licensed black plumber in the city of Buffalo. And okay. his father was a minister of a really large church in Buffalo called Shaw Memorial AME Zion. So well connected. Yeah. yeah. And so the crazy thing was my mom had that duality mm -hmm. when the street side yeah and from the professional side yeah that growing up we did things that other kids didn't do we went to residential camp there was this like i said my mom met this this white family their name was the genthers and this is i take it back this is before we even moved and my mom bought her first house. They had a farm and, you know, this is because my mom was heavy into the Panther movement and, um... I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. Heavy into the Panther movement and then they had also gotten into the, um, communism movement. See, all this stuff yeah. I didn't know about. So it was... It I remember growing up when we finally moved to the house on St. Louis. They used to have the little Mao Say Tongue books and boxes in the basement that they would pass out the whole communism thing. I mean, I almost didn't get my security clearance when I was in the military because of that. Wow. Because uh, they had pictures and everything else. So when I went to get my clearance, they actually showed us pictures. They had Auntie Trina the same thing. She got hemmed up and she almost didn't get her clearance too because we would be in these rallies and these marches. Right. We were kids. We didn't know. You of had course. signs and, oh, down with the bourgeoisie. And, yeah. You know, it was like, so because of my mom's upbringing there was things we did we got to do that other kids didn't get to do so going to school mm -hmm. uncle carl and i we had trench coats and shoes yeah. and slacks we didn't have jeans that's so crazy we, we didn't wear sneakers we, yeah. like I said, we didn't have jeans you know it was slacks yeah and this was in, in, in public school yeah yeah so it, it was it was really strange for us I did mean, you get but, picked on I don't remember being picked on for that. I remember being picked on because I was so short. Yeah. All the way up until I was in high school, probably like around my sophomore year or junior year of high school, mm -hmm. I wasn't even five feet tall. Really? Yeah. Like I was like four eleven uh, as a sophomore in high school. I was Whoa, still four eleven. That is small. Yeah. <laughs> it was so funny. I mean, Granddad used to take me when he would get me on Saturdays, and he would take me to the shoe store because I went Converse All Stars. Back then, they didn't make shoes for kids. Yeah. So the smallest size Aww. was like a size, <laughs> like I think it was like a size one. Yeah. And I was just pushing a size 12. 12. <laughs> and it was like, nope, feet not big enough yet. And I'd leave the store crying all the yeah. time. So we knew as kids that you don't go down on the, on the other side too far mm -hmm. where all the white kids are at because the older kids and some of the adults would chase you. You, you told me a story about when you were younger, you were walking back from school or something, and you got chased. Oh, I used to get chased quite often. Yeah. <laughs> this is even when I was in high school. That's so yeah. wild to you me, yo. in high school, it was just like that. So, so, like, when they would chase you with, like, malintentions, if they were to catch you, or were yes. they trying to scare you? Well, we didn't know. I think maybe the adults, it used to be a motorcycle club, so it was a playground on Sycamore. Yeah. So we used to go to Sycamore Playground. So they would let us come over there and play, mm. but it was a motorcycle playing club right next door to the playground you know we could play over there but no one understand if they came out and they said something racial slurs then it was time to go all right let's go we gotta go yeah so you'd never go over there by yourself it'd be like you know 10 15 kids from the neighborhood we would all go up there together mm -hmm. and, and go to this park it was a huge park and we go over there and play on the, on the playground equipment mm -hmm. and then you know we, we all had to leave at the same time so we'd all leave and go back together wow. and you were how old i think uh i may have been 12 13 mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was in seventh grade.
kids. We got to do things that other kids in the neighborhood never got to do. Yeah. Um, we all had bikes. Mm -hmm. Uncle Carl and I had skateboards. We all had roller skates. Yeah. We had basketball. We had footballs. Um, we had hockey sticks. The engine we had of baseball the gloves. We had everything. Yeah. Except for we just didn't have trendy clothes. Mm -hmm. And so we used to always think we were poor. I know. I used to always think we were so poor. <laughs> but we always did things that other kids never got to do. Yeah. I eat a summer camp. We'd be gone for, you know, weeks at a time to summer camp. Overnight. Weeks. Overnight camp. That's, that's huge. Yeah, weeks. Yeah. So we'd go away for two weeks, come back for about two weeks, and then we'd gone again for another two weeks. Wow. It's exposing you guys to mm -hmm. everything. Yeah, and that's so. very important, I feel like, mm -hmm. especially today. A lot of parents are super... Which it makes sense. Worlds are it's different now, but I feel like a lot of parents just don't take the time to expose their kids to different stuff. Right. Um, and I remember telling Allison, I was like, if I can help it or if we can help it, I want to try to show him as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And I even think to this day still that we kind of are shortcoming on our responsibility as parents to expose him to different stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, to be able to have that as a kid, like I think it's very important. It's, it's a little. It was different for us because all our family was there. Yeah. So we had my grandfather who mm -hmm. would pick us up from things, yeah. or my dad. Uh, a lot of times, as we got a little bit older, probably around the time we were in middle in uh, middle school, no, not even middle school, in elementary school, mm -hmm. we walked everywhere. It was more a community effort to raising mm -hmm. kids. So like, if you were getting out of line, I imagine like your neighbor. To a certain extent, we're like, hey, you get yourself together, I'm going to tell your mother. You right. know what I mean? Like, now, kids are outside playing, and they get in trouble. They want to call the cops immediately. The saying, it takes a village, is gone now. Yeah. So it was the first black... Build Academy. Build Academy. It was like a Montessori school. It was like, pretty much all the teachers were black, the principal was black, and all the students were black. Yeah. And there were some white teachers there, but... 90, 95% of the teachers were black. Mm -hmm. So they had more vested interest in the kids, making sure that they got right. the things that they needed to progress and go further on. So from there, I went to this school called uh, West Hurdle. It's the gender fight. It's another gender fight area. Yeah. But I got bust. Like on Everybody Hates Chris. Yeah. Hour and 45 minutes to get to school every day. Hour and 45 minutes? About that, to get to school Whoa. every morning. So I got bust all the way out there. Black then it was called Whiteyville. <laughs> Whiteyville? No black people out there. Yeah. And this was during the series Roots came out, and it was such a scary time uh, because we had to go through the white neighborhood and go to this white school, and people would bang on the buses when we were on the city bus trying to get back home and oh, trying boy. to intimidate us. We were kids. Yeah. And so you got these older kids who were doing it. Out seventh grade is when I went there. It was, it was a really weird time back then. So I mean, even then, it was still really segregated. It was still really segregated and racist. So I can't even imagine like having to begin to explain those kinds of things to Lyndon. That's my biggest concern about having kids. It's not about my own personal be my like ability to raise them and being there for them and fathering them. It's the outside influence. It's the things that people say to them that I can't control. It just blows my mind that like when you were in seventh grade having to deal with such like racial hostility mm -hmm. as a child, I couldn't even imagine. Couldn't even imagine having to have that conversation or just deal with those kinds of things. That was just life for you. Just a normal day. Mm -hmm. Like you woke up, went to school, here they come, mm -hmm. you know, here they come. Um, her and I used to argue all the time. Yeah. Auntie Tiff, her sister, and Uncle Carl used to argue all the time. <laughs> Them more so than, than me and your mom. So like I oh. mentioned before, you guys live on the same street with four houses away. So they, by the time they moved onto the, onto the street, it was mostly all blacks. So you and mom met around what age? Because she's 9 or 10? Yeah. Nine and y'all were not friends. No. Yeah. Not friends at all. We were not friends. But here was the thing. I think probably around the time we were like 12, 11 or 12, my mom was working night shift. Uh -huh. And so my mom was always, she always had a second job, a, a business, something yeah. that she was in. It was always some multi-level marketing nonsense yeah. that she was always getting involved in. So she couldn't afford to take all of us. So at night we would go to her, their house. Mm -hmm. That was around the time I started liking your mother. Yeah. And it was so funny. So we were boyfriend and girlfriend, but nobody knew it but us. <laughs> and I remember it, she kissed me when uh -huh. we were going to bed because me and Uncle Carl slept on the pullout in, uh, in the living room. Mm -hmm. And I remember she came and she kissed me. Yeah. And I remember telling her, so this is still our joke now. You missed. <laughs> you kissed me on my eye. 
So we would sneak and kiss mm. um, at the back door, be kissing just just lips to lips, just mushing, <laughs> and just mm. yeah, yeah. That was the greatest. Then we kind of drifted apart, and I think probably it was a period of time when I went to, when I went to go live with my dad, mm. and I had kind of stopped speaking to my mom altogether. So. I would, you know, I want to go over there because I still want to see Uncle Carl and mm -hmm. Auntie Benita and Auntie Nina. So I still wanted to see them. So I would go over there and hang out with them. Right. And you know, I knew my mom was getting ready to come home. And then I'd leave and I'd go down the street to your mom's house and i hang out down there. And I, I was annoying. Yeah. I knew I was annoying. She said that it was, uh, you were always siding with her mom. Yeah. yeah. And <laughs> I, I think I was just being an annoying jerk. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was. And so she hated me for that. Yeah. So she told me you, um, you pushed her off her bike or something? No. Okay. No? No, so that, that's something else. <laughs> so that's a fast forward story to high school. Maybe freshman year, sophomore year. You guys went to ring dance or senior prom or something like yeah, that? Yeah, so this was years later. This was, I think we started actually dating about a month before we graduated high school. Okay. Yeah, this is way later. Yeah, then. way yeah. later. Okay. So about a month before we graduated high school. I mean, she had, girlfriend, she had boyfriends and I had girlfriends. Mm -hmm. So probably about a month before we graduated high school... I was hanging out at her house. I used to hang out over there all the time. I thought I was super popular. Go to, I would go to all the parties. And, yeah. You know, I, I had clothes and shoes. And so I, the haircut, I, I thought I was the dude. Mm -hmm. Your mom, their family didn't have as much. Mm -hmm. So she didn't go a lot of places. So I'd be like, I'm going to this party. You mm -hmm. want to go? And so I'd take her to parties, different parties. So, but and it was a funny thing. I was not even, I wasn't even into her. Mm -hmm. I get to school one day, and this cat that saw her at a party and saw me with her at a party, he, he told me, he said, oh, who was that girl he was with? And I'm like, who, 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 who she look like? Right. So he's telling me, and I'm like, I don't know her. What? No. Yeah. And so then, all of a sudden, idiot, that was Lynn. Yeah, yeah. And I'm... <laughs> I was like, she was fine. Yeah. And he was like, yeah, that girl was fine. He was like, hook me up. What? You're right. <laughs> oh, he was like, hook me up. And I was like, she fine? Okay. And so then one day I was at the house and I was just looking at her and I was yeah. like, wow. Okay. In a different I light, think right? She's fine. Yeah, as soon as someone else yeah. makes it real for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and we were wrestling on the floor one day and then she kissed me. <laughs> and that and was, that was it. it. And I was like, okay. <laughs> This is happening. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> and a month later, we went to prom. Yeah. <laughs> then we graduated high school. And yeah. And it was so funny because before Jamal, she got pregnant. I left. I followed Auntie Trina, and I went to National Guard because I wanted to have some money in my pocket. So I went to school. I went to the National Guard, following Auntie Trina as an MP. Yeah. Did that. And... So this is... Jamal was born? Jamal, uh, -uh She was pregnant. Okay. Because when she decided, oh, we're about to have a baby. We teenagers, we're going to have a baby. Yeah. And I think I was 18. So you were 18. 18. This but, was before Jamal. Okay. Cause she, so, no, we, yeah, we were 18. Because she had a miscarriage she had a before miscarriage. Jamal? She had a miscarriage before, okay. before Jamal. And so it was like, oh, boy. All right, I was in, in basic training. And I remember it was like, oh, my goodness. Like, okay. I need to make sure I have some money to be able to take care of my son. I don't yeah. want to be a deadbeat, dumb dad. So I was like, all right, so school was out. I went to National Guard, came back. So but while I was gone, she had a miscarriage. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay. Reset. Reset, all right. I'm going to be smart about this. Yeah. So she kept on saying, that, oh, I want to have another baby. I want to do it again. I was like, no. Mm -hmm. And then, so she kept on saying that. I was like, next year this time, we'll talk about it. Next year this time. I'm thinking that it's going to be so out of her mind. Nope. Yeah. Here we go again. Then Jamal gets announced. You were how old? When he was born, I was 19. 19. Mm -hmm. So what was... No, the... actually, I was 20, and she was 19. And you were still in the National Guard? Mm-hmm. So what were you thinking at that point? I was National Guard. I was in school. 19. And I was... 20. Yeah. And I was working um, part-time at a nursing home. I just got to a point where I was just like, yeah, so it was like, when he was born, I was like, okay, at least I'm not a statistic. Mm -hmm. I'm not a teen father. I'm 20 when he was born. I had just turned 20. He was, my birthday's October. He was born in January. Yeah. So I was like, I'm not a statistic. I made it. Yeah. <laughs> By the skin of your teeth, you know? <laughs>
by the skin. But I was like, I'm not a statistic. Because <laughs> that was my biggest thing. Like, when I got Allison pregnant, mm-hmm. like, I was a statistic. I was a a college graduate with a degree, in a different respect, mm-hmm. yes. College graduate with a degree. I knocked up a white chick. And I, my job situation wasn't the best. I was like, I can't find a job to keep a job. I can't. A good enough that's going to pay me within the respect of my, my degree and I felt I was like it's not good I'm not happy with this at all when Jamal got here and I was just like I was in school I remember taking him to class with me a couple times you know towards the end of the semester and your mom and I I think we were off and on again mm-hmm. off and on and it was one of the off times and I just decided I got to do better for my son the military was the big cop out. So you didn't go in the military. If you went in the military, you were a failure in life. Mm-hmm. So that was what they used to perpetuate. We had no recruiters or anything used to come to our school. Cause I mean- It was like a last ditch resort yeah. at that point. Yeah. So I was just like, I said, I got a son. I'm not really doing that well in college. Time I gotta go. do better. I'm gonna go ahead and go in the military. At least this way I know I have money to take care of my son. Mm-hmm. So I went on active duty because I'd already gone to basic training. So I went straight to San Antonio to Fort Sam. And I was at Fort Sam for, I went there for a veterinary, I mean not a veterinary, but a food inspector. Okay. So my MOS there, I believe, was close to three and a half months or four months. Mm-hmm. And I flunked out my last week. Last week? The last week is how I ended up going into telecommunications. And that's when your MOS is in... Germany from yeah. Telecom. Okay. Mm-hmm. 89, I believe, is when. 88 or 89 is when I went to Germany. Oh. Um, no, you were born in Germany, so you were 88. Yeah. So 87 is when I went to when Germany. Germany. Okay. Yeah, so I went to Germany. What was the scene like there? So, like, I know it was a clear difference between what it was like going to Buffalo. Oh, man, it was, it was great in Germany. I mean, there was a lot. The wall was still up, mm. so there wasn't a whole lot of racism. Mm-hmm. Germans loved black people. I remember you telling me that years it ago. It was ridiculous. I mean, how much love they had for black people. Yeah. I mean, I'm guessing because it wasn't a whole lot of us mm-hmm. there. I just didn't experience a whole lot of prejudice and we actually almost got out and stayed in Germany. Yeah. I had a nice job lined up. So what made you guys come back? Export. Um, back then, Granddad Percy was an alcoholic. Mm-hmm. Grandma Joe had already died. Mm-hmm. And when you guys came, I was, in, I was back in the States while you guys were in Germany. I had to come back and go to school. Mm-hmm. And so when Grandma Joe died, your mom didn't make it back in time. She didn't get to see her before she died. Oh, okay. We're going to get out. She had a, her government job, so which means we could have still had PX and commissary privileges, and mm-hmm. I would have been making good money, and the landlord that we had, had lined me up with this great job. So we would have been okay, but then she decided, oh, what happens if my dad is out there drunk, and mm-hmm. he falls and hits his head, and you know I'm, I'm all the way over dead. here, and so... She was like, I want to go back home. So I was like, all right, I went and told my unit, okay, I need to extend. Mm-hmm. And it was like, um, you, we don't have a space for you here, so you're going to have to go back to the States. And you go back to the States, you want to extend, you're going to have to stay in for another two years. Mm-hmm. So I was like, all right, fine. And I signed up for another two years. I got promoted and, you know, did some things. But by the time I decided, okay, I think I want to stay, mm-hmm. it was already too late in order to get promoted to the next grade so that you could stay in. They said, uh, you got to compete with uh, 3,000 people. And so it was like people who had been in a little bit longer than me and who had taken it serious Mm -hmm. and did some of those things they needed to do. So I got to the point where I was like, okay, I considered myself Mm -hmm. high speed enough. So I did all those things that I needed to do and I was sitting at the top Mm -hmm. just waiting for some other people to get promoted so that I could get one of those slots. Yeah. So I was just sitting there waiting for that promotion, but nobody else was getting promoted so I can get one of those slots. So when did you get into fashion? This is kind of like a jump to a new topic, but Um, fashion, was it in Germany? No, I got into fashion when I was in high school. By the time I got to high school, my high school, we had to wear a shirt and tie to school every day. So I used to try and set myself apart from all the white kids and a few of the black kids that I went to school with. Mm -hmm. And I always wanted to have something that nobody else had on. I I had a buddy whose family had some money. And I was like, okay, I can't afford all the nice things he has, so I need to 
do my own thing differently and have something that not everybody else is wearing and mm-hmm. try and have some stuff first right before other people and you know hook up some different some different looks so that's what I was kind of doing between that world and the whole hip hop thing. I remember seeing pictures because Jamal and I always had the hottest stuff on. Mm-hmm. It was like airbrush overalls and mm-hmm. years years later, Helly Hansen, Nike, mm-hmm. everything. Um, you didn't like Jamal and I being in bobos. I'm curious to elaborate what uh, what bobos, bobos. are. Uh, no name sneakers, sneakers that didn't have a high name on them. Yeah, but but buy you guys. Nikes mm-hmm. and felines, but not the top brand. I mean, I had what I called nigger moments. Uh-huh. I had two nigger moments that I could recall when you guys were little. When we were, in, you guys were in Germany, mm-hmm. and I bought you guys two pair of Jordans. Yeah. <laughs> and after that point, I thought to myself, I was like, "What is wrong with me? What is wrong with you, fool? <laughs> this is this is this is such niggerism." So out of pocket for you. Don't do, do this. Right? So yeah. I was like, Yo, they're gonna outgrow these shoes. And- <laughs> You're just wasting money on foolishness. You're going to be showing them the wrong things. Don't do it. And yeah. I didn't do it anymore. Yeah. You never got another pair of Jordans mm-hmm. until you were in college. Yeah. <laughs> this is true, though. I'm not doing it. Why? Yeah. It's such a huge waste of money, and it's teaching you guys the wrong thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Work within your means to separate yourself from right. the majority. So mm-hmm. That's another thing that like I picked up from you years ago. Like No matter what everyone else is doing... Still try to find within yourself to do your own thing, right. essentially. I was like, so we say, nah, I don't want, nah, I'm not doing that. I'm, yeah. a, I want people to follow me and do the things that yeah. I do. Yeah. So when did you know you wanted to open a store? The crazy thing about it was, I knew I wanted to open a store when I was in Germany. Um, what really was the biggest point in my life, I think, the store closing. And then you not necessarily going into like a downward spiral and not turning to drinking and mm-hmm. still making it happen for the family and making things, making ends meet. Mm-hmm. Um, taking the, the thousands of dollars in product you had and just hitting the street basically. That's it. And having to make it work. Almost $20,000 worth of merchandise, approximately yeah. $22,000 worth of merchandise. Is... Put it in storage, took it out of storage, had a little old Mercedes Benz, an IDE, loaded up the Benz and... Figured I hit barber shops. Yeah. Hit the barber shops up, and that turned into me being a hustle man for almost seven years. Seven years. Seven years. I was Let's... a hustle man for. No, I take it back. I was a hustle man for probably ten years. That's wild. So the store closed in ninety eight. Ninety nine. When did you, when I think did the you store start? Closed in ninety nine. Ninety nine. Yeah. So when did you start going to the hustle? Right away. Right away. As soon as the store closed. Yeah. That next week. I remember being in. Middle school, high school, even beginning years of college. So you didn't talk about how I became the hustle man. And there was another reason as to why I became the hustle man. Or just before I closed the store, the company that I was renting from, for the the store, yeah, for the space, they wanted me to give them an additional $6,000 to re-sign my lease for another five years. The attorney suggested, well, go ahead and file a bankruptcy uh, but don't go through it. it that way it'll give you 90 days if you still want to find a partner to say so I did that and Then I couldn't find a partner. So I ended up closing the store. Okay. So fast forward um, Three years later. I'm working as a, as a contractor doing like I said doing declassification It was time for me to do my periodic investigation reinvestigation for my top-secret security clearance that um, bankruptcy that I filed some years ago and never went through with that I was led to believe that was just a dismissal. It popped up and they said that I intentionally misled them Whoa. Uh, with the bankruptcy that I never went through with. And so they snatched my security clearance and told me I could uh, reapply again in a year. But this is off of the advice from your attorney. This is off of the advice of the attorney. He, he claimed ignorance because he didn't know anything about government contracts and how the security clearance and all that other thing went because that was not something that we ever discussed. So there I was, two kids, a mortgage, and unemployed. It was full-fledged, 100% hustle man from that point on. So the connection that I had with it, it was the hustle man, but it was way more than just being the hustle man. The way I, I process it, I tell people about it is, and we're kind of deviating from the, of the main topic, um, but it's very important to kind of hit this though. Man, you're not just out there, you know, hustling in the streets. You were actually providing for in- individuals who couldn't provide for their children. The- 
my way of like attaching it to like making it real for somebody to understand is kids are mean mm -hmm. and when you don't have the right kind of clothes mm -hmm. to, to wear to school kids will point you out they'll right. clown you they'll joke you and here you come in with an affordable option to then have their children feel confident within themselves mm -hmm. to then go to school and be able to focus on exactly. what's important so uh, that's what I used to always tell your mother my my business was recession proof so because we had hit a big recession when the housing market crashed I was going into the low-income areas where these people were spending their last dollars to go into the stores and buy their kids that one expensive trinket to try and make them feel good and I gave them the option that you could buy this this and this and this for what you're gonna pay for that like you said earlier the nigga moment yeah yeah and I appreciated you for doing that and providing another option for people to help their kids down the line. I guess. And at one point, while being a hustle man, I employed six other people. So I'd go wholesale, but they would buy from me from New York and buy, and then I had other people who would come to me and they would buy, and they were doing the same things in different communities. I was all over the place with yeah. this. Yeah, yeah, the crazy thing was, I started out uh, hustling CDs. Yeah, yeah. So I started out hustling well, CDs. Well, no, it wasn't it mixtapes. It was well, the yeah, mixtapes. Well, it was mixtapes in the store. Okay. I would sell CDs. This is back when CDs were $22, $23 a piece. One for five, two for 10. CDs and DVDs, the Billy Blanks workout CD. Then the bootleg movies, the yeah. VHS with people walking across the screen, graduated from you that. Hear, to, hear coughing in the background. Yeah. Yeah. And all of this happened with the, with the DVDs before there was a law saying that it was a no to do it. Yeah, piracy. There was no there was no law, so it's not like we were really breaking the law, but just the fact that we were selling them without a license. Yeah. I didn't want to get a vendor's license because I didn't want to pay taxes. Yeah. It turns out then they changed the law and I graduated from from uh, CDs and DVDs back to clothing, more clothing. Yeah. And then at that point I graduated to selling shoes. Pause for a sec. I want to just talk about your outfit and what's going on in the scene right now. So this truck it's a new or a news Mark LT, which you just bought, right? Yeah. So when he told me he was going to buy this truck, I wasn't too fond of it. But seeing you in the driver's seat <laughs> does look really good. <laughs> so let's talk about the shoes. The shoe game, um, I would go to like, let's just say I, I go to New York and I'd buy cases of shoes. Mm -hmm. So let's just say Air Force One. Like then what Air year Force was this? Ones. What year was this? This was uh, probably... 92 for reference so no, yeah. no 99 so I met Dapper Dan in New York Dapper, um, Dan. Dapper Dan he used to make all the clothes for everybody back all the dope boys back in the 80s probably like around 1994 uh, probably around the same time the Jada kiss knock yourself out video had came out and he had uh, Air Force Ones with uh, Louis Vuitton with the Gucci check mark on them. Yeah, this 2000, is 2000, 2001, 2000. Oh, we probably about to 2007. Cats weren't even on that at that time. I see so many people on like Instagram posting about it now on Facebook. Like, this is what I'm talking about. But this Real is a funny deal. thing. Through a buddy of mine I knew who grew up in Queens, we were up in New York City and just happened to run up on Dapper Dan and he was selling uh, fur coats. Mm -hmm. And so my buddy said, Yo, I think that's Dap right there. So, you know, went over, introduced myself to him. And at that time, he showed me the Air Force One and said this was going to be the thing. But, uh, he got some rapper kid that's going to be wearing him in his video. He said some rapper yeah. kid? Yeah. Wow. Never knew who the rapper kid he was talking about. But fast forward a couple months later, Jada Kiss knock yourself out and he got him on. Wow. So at this time, I decided, hey, I think I can do this. I figured out a way I can do it myself. I came up, came up with a name for the business and it was called... Designer Originals Incorporated. Ray-Bans, though. Ray-Bans. I have to pay extra for those. Yeah. Let me see. I'm looking for the mirror. Oh, there okay. it is. Let me see. I like these. Those are like my sunglasses, kind of. Yeah, those are dope. Yeah, I like these. Decisions, decisions. Daddy's getting old eyes. Old, wise eyes. I like the other ones better, though. Oh, so the whole Dapper Dan thing was was a big, 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 big thing for me. I, I looked at some of the things that Dap was doing, and I decided, okay, I can do some of the same things that Dap is doing. I learned how to sew. Your mom got me started on a sewing machine. This Korean lady named Koom 
uh, her brother was actually doing one of the one of the people that I had who was actually sewing the check marks on the shoes and doing different things. And so at that point, I started getting fabric and buying shirts and switching out, putting different things on it, like uh, Gucci, Louis, Burberry, Fendi, uh, Christian Dior, Coach. Um, I remember I took some uh, T-shirts and I cut out Gucci logos, went online and figured out how to get the Gucci logos and yeah. printed those out and did different things. With, you know, I remember doing that and. Uh, SRK, remember SRK? Yeah, Spoil Rotten Kids. Yeah, yeah. I remember that's right. Cause one year for Christmas, I did the, the Gucci for you and your brother. And the funny thing was, it got to a point where uh, a store in Georgetown was buying the stuff from me uh -huh. and selling it for three times the amount I was. They was uh, they were paying me for it. Cause you're the OG. It was called Originals. And they used to sell Kooji. It was it was doing pretty good down there. I was taking stuff down there. I still have the receipt book. Yeah, we gotta find that. I still have the receipt book. It's in my car. I would do jerseys and put uh, Gucci, uh, Louis, or whatever on the on the numbers yeah. and on the names on the, the jerseys. Classic joints. Yeah, right those and they would sell them out of there. That's great. Fendi on this the is jeans. Georgetown. Yeah. Oh, so, gee. So Fendi on the jeans, on the pockets, yeah. and on the belt loops, and on the inside bottom cuff of the pants, and. Yeah. yeah, stuff and on a zipper, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And again, what what year was this? This was probably in like around 1999 or 2000, Cats 2001. Cats just don't know. <laughs> so yeah. I was doing the same thing Dap was doing. And I even went so far as to buying blank wool bomber jackets. Yeah. Taking the collar off, taking the cuffs off, and putting the Gucci ribbon on the collars before Gucci like was this. doing yeah, yeah like, like this I would take this out and put Gucci uh, ribbing on it Gucci ribbing on the sleeves put Gucci on this portion of the pockets yeah. and uh, rubber Gucci on the pockets and the tags and everything and I would sell those the shirt they knew I told them I said yo look this is something that I made yeah but yo know, this it looks good and anybody else gonna have this you're gonna be the only cat with this designer originals that's what it was yeah. uh, the nickname Dre the Baker okay so not Dre so Dre came about um, it's weird because when I was first in the streets I didn't want people to know my real name yeah and it's so funny because we're talking about 15 20 years and people still refer to me as Drake. <laughs> I, I tried to make it as close to my name, so because I knew there were people who remembered me from when we had the store. So I came up with the alter ego Wayne Andre Harrington. <laughs> and instead of just using Andre, it was just Drake. Ray allowed me to switch up my vernacular. For me, the I enjoyed so much the whole thought process of something that I was coming up with in my head and I would tell other people about it and they were so interested in it and it was to the point where I could say no this is what you need to be doing yeah. you need to be wearing this with this with this with this right and I think that was the greatest part for me so like I remember when you had the store like you were telling me about like merchandising yeah and uh, being able to put the outfit together for somebody that's walking into a store as opposed to just having it on the racks, mm -hmm. and they can then visualize themselves wearing it and putting the outfit together. Yeah. Our outfit. Yeah, there. and that was the crazy thing when, you know, first couple of times people would come in and they would see displays that I'd set up in the store and they were like, Yo, I want that outfit, I want it just like that, everything. So once I figured it out, it was like, this is it, every week, we have like seven or eight different, you know, fits up here on display. We got to change them out at least every week. Yeah. So based on the response from the shoes, what was your next step? Like what, what, that's what question I had for yeah. you. Yeah. So I got robbed a couple times in the streets. After that last time I got robbed and I just thought to myself, you know what? This is not so much uh, old, old man's game. Really just don't want to be bothered with this anymore. And I think it's... It's about time to go ahead and give this up. That was around the time, Mom. Like, we were all kind of chiming at you, too, chirping, like, hey. Yeah. So, actually, what happened, so around that time, um, I had a buddy that switched over and was doing loans for housing. So it was a buddy of mine, dude that I, I met in the streets. His name was uh, Silk. Silk. Silk, but his real name was Jonathan. Uh. <laughs> so I decided, all right, I'm going to try and do the housing thing and buy a couple houses and flip. 
so I decided to try and get into the housing market, bought a couple houses and...